The Beatles' Beach Boys rivalry is legendary. Recently, however, two of the Beach Boys were interviewed and may have inadvertently revealed some details regarding the long-standing 1960s pop music rivalry. The interview also uncovers a secret preview of the Pet Sounds album by Lennon and McCartney, which led to a Beatles classic on Revolver, and up the rivalry to a new level. While much has been made of the past competition between the two bands, that has pretty much subsided since many consider the Beatles the undisputed champions of cultural and music influence to have emerged out of the 1960s. But these new details may reveal the rivalry felt between both bands that lingered on. Let's take a look at how the Beatles and Beach Boys influenced one another during their peak competition years of 1965 to 1967 and what these new details reveal about their friendly creative competition that, frankly, the world ultimately still benefits from. The band the Beatles initially most competed with in the U.S. were the Beach Boys, which inspired some of both bands' classic songs, keeping them on their toes, trying to anticipate what the other would do next and then outshine them. It seems counterintuitive that a British mod-esque band with an unrelenting Mersey beat could be inspired by a Southern California surfer band with sunny optimism. Sonically and aesthetically, they seemed worlds apart. The Beach Boys were about the beach, girls and fun, fun, fun. Then, as soon as American women caught sight of these well-dressed men with a sense of humor, it was game on. No! Sorry! Next question! Okay, we can't sing. No, we need money first. <laughs> we'll shake it up, baby, now! Shake it up, baby! Twist and shout! Twist and shout! In 1964, three months after I Want to Hold Your Hand topped the U.S. charts, I Get Around became the Beach Boys' first number one hit. When the Beatles began writing more introspective songs, leaving behind much of their early bubblegum pop songs, the Beach Boys took notice along with the rest of the world. Brian was also growing tired of the Beach Boys' early sound and wanted to push them forward in order to be perceived as interesting and stay relevant. Brian Wilson soon began composing pet sounds based on the innovative new songs he heard on Rubber Soul. Rubber Soul is probably the greatest record ever, Brian wrote in his memoir, I Am Brian Wilson. It came out in December of 1965 and sent me right to the piano bench. It wasn't just the lyrics and the melodies, but the production and their harmonies. It was almost art music. The song that Brian composed when he went to his piano and tried to top Rubber Soul, God Only Knows, which Paul McCartney later called his favorite song of all time. It was what the other was lacking that drove some of the inspiration and competition between the bands. Paul McCartney said this in 1990 of the Beach Boys album. It was pet sounds that blew me out of the water. First of all, it was Brian's writing. I love the album so much. I've just bought my kids each a copy of it for their education in life. I figure no one is educated musically till they've heard that album. I was into the writing and the songs. In a recent interview with The Times, the Beach Boys revealed a secret preview that Lennon and McCartney got of Pet Sounds. The Beach Boys bassist and backing singer Bruce Johnston was a touring member in 1965 after Brian Wilson had a breakdown in December 1964. One day I told our publicist Derek Taylor, who had been the Beatles' publicist, that I wanted to go to England, you know, have a look around. I had a little record player in the hotel suite with pet sounds on it, which hadn't been released in England yet. Johnston continues, 
I came back from dinner one evening to find John Lennon and Paul McCartney in the suite, waiting to hear pet sounds. They loved it, made me play the album twice, and said the five vocals on Wouldn't It Be Nice helped them right here, there, and everywhere. When asked about songs that were inspired by pet sounds, McCartney shared the following, John and I used to be interested in what the old-fashioned writers used to call the verse, which we nowadays would call the intro, this whole preamble to a song. John and I were quite into those from the old-fashioned songs that used to have them, and in putting To Lead a Better Life on the front of here, there and everywhere, we were doing harmonies, and the inspiration for that was the Beach Boys. We had that in our minds during the introduction to here, there, and everywhere. To lead a better life, I need my love to be here. No one's gonna make it that much better when we can say goodnight and stay to While McCartney may in retrospect be able to express his full-blown love of the album Pet Sounds and the Beach Boys, it seems that he did have some critique as well that he let slip in 1968 in India. During the Beach Boys interview, singer Mike Love expressed his annoyance at something that Paul McCartney said during their famed 1968 trip to Rishikesh, India. Mike Love discusses the critique that came in 1968 after the Beatles' masterpiece Sgt. Pepper. Then there was Sgt. Pepper, we did the cover shoot for Pet Sounds at San Diego Petting Zoo, and when I was in India at the Maharishi's place in Rishikesh in 1968, Paul McCartney said, Mike, you really need to take more care of your album covers. I was somewhat chagrined, so I said, Paul, we've always been more concerned with what's in the sleeve than what's on the outside. Well, I had to come up with something. The Beatles' Sgt. Pepper was not only a music masterpiece, many hailed the album cover as a visual masterpiece as well, which incorporated a collage of referencing cultural influences from the dark Edgar Allan Poe and Aleister Crowley to Wholesome Shirley Temple and Lewis Carroll to scientific Albert Einstein and Carl Jung. Artist Peter Blake, who created the cover, said, In my mind, I was making a piece of art rather than an album cover. It was almost a piece of theater design. I offered the idea that if they had just played a concert in the park, the cover could be a photograph of them with the group who had watched the concert, he said. If we did this by using cardboard cutouts, it could be whomever they wanted. The Beach Boys' Pet Sounds album cover was more literal with them feeding pets at the San Diego Zoo. The day was covered in an April 1966 edition of KRLA Beat, a music-focused newspaper for teens, in a spread that featured photos of the five Beach Boys posing with giraffes and goats. The reporter who was there covering the story said, Once inside the zoo, we headed for the children's zoo, where we were led into a huge pen which contained various odd species of lambs, goats, llamas, and a few other animals which defied any sort of description. It had been a wild and wonderful day, a day which found Dennis sharing a hot dog and Fritos with a llama, a day which saw Brian in his first face-to-face -face encounter with a curious giraffe, a day which watched Mike eat every hot dog in the entire zoo. So why was the album titled Pet Sounds? According to Brian Wilson, the group had decided to call the album Pet Sounds before they visited San Diego Zoo for the cover photo shoot. He says the title was inspired by three things. His two dogs, whose barks were recorded and used as effects at the end of Caroline, No, Phil Spector, whose initials were the same as Pet Sounds, and the idea that the music on the album was very personal and featured his pet as in favorite sounds. Brian Wilson said of the album in a 2010 interview, if you take the Pet Sounds album as a collection of art pieces, each designed to stand alone, yet which belong together, you'll see what I was aiming at. Soon after Pet Sounds was released, 
the Beatles began working on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The album and the single Strawberry Fields Forever soon caused Brian to abandon his work on his follow-up masterpiece, the album Smile stating the Beatles already achieved what Smile set out to do. So was the snide remark Paul McCartney made to Mike Love in 1968, a peek into the rivalry after Sgt. Pepper, or was it just constructive criticism about their album covers? Seems an unusual time and place to offer up that criticism when you're on a spiritual retreat. Whatever the case, it clearly got under Mike Love's skin since he brought it up in an interview 50 years later at 83 years old. Lucky had come, equipped with a gun, to shoot off the legs of his rival. Another revelation from the interview was that the Beach Boys had reconciled their differences with Brian Wilson, who is now under conservatorship due to his ailing health. They even shared some terrifying details about how Brian's father, Murray, who once managed the band, berated them and was violent with the Wilson brothers. Brian once claimed that Murray hit him over the head with a lead pipe so viciously that the hearing in his right ear was damaged permanently. Dennis, who would fight back against his father's aggression, would later turn to substance abuse, which led to his drowning in 1983 after an all-day drinking binge. Although it also did not help that he was caught up with the Manson family cult right before their notorious crimes in 1969. Mike Love discussed in his autobiography his horror at realizing one of them had babysat his children in 1968. At the time, Love was separated from his wife and mother of his children, Suzanne, who was involved with his cousin and fellow band member, Dennis Wilson. Susan Atkins had landed the job of babysitter after Dennis fell under the spell of Manson in the summer of 1968. Love recalls how Manson and his deranged followers began taking over every aspect of Dennis's life, including his home. Mike Love's legal battles with Brian Wilson actually stemmed from Brian's father, Murray, selling the Beach Boys publishing rights for just $700,000 in 1969 and leaving Mike Love's writing credits off of 79 songs resulting in Mike Love suing Brian Wilson after Murray's death. Love explains, Brian was so gifted they called him the genius, but he wasn't adept at lyrics. That was my role and I wasn't credited by Murray. Johnston furthers Love's claim. I was there when session musicians, the Wrecking Crew, were recording California Girls with Brian. Brian shouted, I need some words. Mike wrote some down on a legal pad, and two hours later he had lyrics to one of the greatest Beach Boys songs of them all. Another Beach Boys song written by Mike Love was Good Vibrations. Love describes the song after a drive down to the studio, the spontaneity of the words, driven by anxiety that I hadn't done them yet combined with Brian's well-thought-out music, made it work. Mike Love and Brian Johnston go on to describe the wedge being formed in the band by outside influences. The incursion of drugs was the most negative thing that ever happened to our group, Love says. He compares his discovering meditation while Brian Wilson discovered LSD. Johnston adds, I never smoked and never took drugs. Instead, I went surfing, still do. By 1968, the competition between the Beatles and the Beach Boys seemed to be dying down after they returned from India and head back to the recording studio. The Beatles released the White Album and the Beach Boys released Friends. Finally, by 1969, Brian Wilson had stepped away from the recording studio and is hospitalized for mental illness. While Abbey Road is released and is considered one of the greatest albums of all time, yet another masterclass in innovation for the Beatles. In the end, there's a valid argument to be made which side was more influenced by the other. But as stated earlier, we are all, the listeners, the benefactors of hearing all the great music that came out of this friendly competition. Thanks to their competitiveness and respect for one another, we end up with some of the best music ever recorded. 
So which band do you prefer between The Beatles or Beach Boys? And which album cover do you think is best between Pet Sounds and Sgt. Pepper? Leave your comments below. Thank you for watching and be sure to subscribe.